The evidence is undeniable. Americans are more polarized than ever. Polls show many Americans believe another civil war is inevitable. Would it be better to say goodbye to each other now before it gets to that point? If history is any indication, it's not very likely. 150 years after the Civil War ended, its wounds still haven't fully healed, yet its lessons begun to fade from memory. It seems like it's only a matter of time before another part of the country tries to stake a claim on independence. Let's take a look at what part of the country is most likely to secede, and how they might fare. New England First, let's go way back and look at the first secession movement in the United States. We're not talking about the South, we're talking about New England. In his farewell address, George Washington warned against political parties as something that would divide the young nation. This lasted, oh, not very long. Washington's successor, John Adams, was a Massachusetts man and a member of the Federalist Party. This gave a powerful voice to New England's concerns, but after Adams left office, New England's voice diminished for quite some time. The Federalist Adams was replaced by the Democratic Republicans, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, both from Virginia. During the Continental Congress, New England's fear of being dominated by the South had almost prevented the nation's formation altogether. Now the South was consolidating power, just as New England had feared. The northern states must be governed by Virginia or must govern Virginia, and there is no middle ground, warned New Yorker Aaron Burr. Additionally, the old families of New England disdained the Germans, Irish, and Scotch-Irish immigrants pouring into the country. These Puritan descendants distrusted the separation of church and state, as they saw public life as inextricably intertwined with private virtue. And, you know, maybe there were some things in Jefferson's private life that made this not such a bad point. Federalist concerns were magnified by the Louisiana Purchase under Jefferson, which threatened to further dilute Northern influence. Now, the Louisiana Purchase brought in Spanish, French, and Indians as well. As New England debated leaving a country barely a quarter of a century year old, there was no question that they had the legal right to secede. People objected to the wisdom of seceding, not their legal right to do so. New Englanders like Charles Pickney came to believe that secession was their only choice, and that for the movement to succeed, they needed New York to join. They conspired to elect Aaron Burr as New York's governor. Once elected, Burr would steer New York into joining the New England secession movement. But after an exceptionally acrimonious campaign, Burr narrowly lost the election. Alexander Hamilton publicly called Burr a dangerous man for entertaining the plot to secession. This was the impetus for the most famous duel in American history. Burr's killing of Hamilton made him a national villain, throwing off plans for New England's secession. After the War of 1812, the New England secession movement collapsed altogether, but its arguments would greatly influence Southern secessionists like John C. Calhoun. Scholarship and polling But by the end of the Civil War, it became clear that states had no legal right to secede. The situation was codified by the Supreme Court in Texas v. White in 1869. The court ruled that because states had no right to secede, legislation passed by the Confederacy had no legal standing. And yet, secession movements are common across the United States. These movements typically have several things in common, an appeal to regional identity, the rhetoric of the American Revolution, and a commitment to achieving independence by nonviolent means, at least nominally. Support for secession may be stronger now than ever before. Barack Obama's re-election in 2012 led to petitions for secession from all 50 states, totaling nearly a million signatures. In 2015, both California and Oregon submitted ballot petitions for secession. A 2018 poll showed 68% of Americans supporting a state's right to peacefully secede. A 2021 poll showed that support for secession was strongest among Southern Republicans, although still widespread across the country. Scholars note that secession is incredibly uncommon in stable democracies like the United States. To secede without bloodshed, breakaway regions have to convince not just their own people to leave, but the rest of the country to let them go peaceably. There's a paradox here that makes seceding so difficult. Independence movements are most common in regions with a high degree of self-rule, which builds confidence in a region's ability to govern itself. But this autonomy undermines the need for independence in the first place, so that regions are less likely to find secession necessary in the first place. The reverse is also true. An oppressive central government increases the desire for independence, but the heavy boot obstructs the formation of secession movements. 
It's called the fear confidence paradox, and scholars have used it to study secession movements in Scotland, Catalonia, and Quebec. But we're talking about the United States of America. If there's one thing we don't lack, it's confidence. So let's take a closer look at the secession movements bubbling under the surface of American life. Cascadia. Some secession movements involve individual states, some involve multiple states, and sometimes secession movements cross national borders entirely. Such is the case of Cascadia, a proposed independent state in the Pacific Northwest that would combine the states of Washington and Oregon with the Canadian province of British Columbia. Since its settlement by non-natives, Northwesterners have regarded themselves as a people apart, self-reliant pioneers, just a little more in touch with the natural world. Regional identity is heavily informed by environmental concerns. It's called bioregionalism, and proponents of Cascadian independence believe that the unique ecology of the Pacific Northwest is an argument for secession and self-government. The movement even has its own flag, featuring the evergreen Douglas fir. It's called the Doug flag. Named for the Cascade Mountains, at its greatest extent, the region includes parts of Montana, Utah, Idaho, Northern California, and as far north as the Yukon. An alternate name for the region is Salmon Nation, in tribute to the fish that sustained indigenous populations in the region for thousands of years. But most efforts focus on the urban cores of Seattle, Portland, and Vancouver, which are increasingly connected. Sometimes talked about as an emerging mega-region, together, Washington, Oregon, and British Columbia are home to 17 million people and generate $1.1 trillion in goods and services annually. In 2008, the Pacific Coast Collaborative mandated cooperation on both sides of the U.S.-Canadian border on matters of forestry, fishing, disaster management, and transportation. Business owners describe a Cascadia technology corridor, with Microsoft, Amazon, and Boeing in Seattle, Pentium and Nike in Portland, and world-class film and video game industries in Vancouver. Former Seattle Mayor Paul Schell is a believer in the shared future of the region, saying that Cascadia represents better than states, countries, and cities the cultural and geographical realities of the corridor. Enthusiasm is particularly strong on the Canadian side of the border, where support for independence rose from 17% to 27% just between 2018 and 2019. Younger Canadians are particularly likely to support secession and to feel estranged from British Columbia's closest neighbor, the conservative, oil industry-dependent Alberta to the east. In 1975, Ernest Kallenbach published his influential novel Ecotopia, about a fictional nation comprising Oregon, Washington, and parts of Northern California, where environmental concerns were the preeminent focus of politics. In 1986, Evergreen State College hosted the first Cascadia Bioregional Congress. The Cascadia movement attracts anti-capitalists and anarchists, people critical of nation-states generally. These people want to see borders erased. After Donald Trump was elected in 2016, visits surged to the Cascadia Now website. Yet the Cascadia movement has always held its progressive bona fides in uneasy tension with the region's libertarian roots. In the run-up to the Civil War, new territories wrestled with the question of joining with or without slavery. Oregon found it easier to ban people of African descent entirely, the only state to join with such a law. Since the 1970s, concurrent with the environmentalist strands pursuing their ecotopia, the region has been an object of white supremacist fantasies of a whites-only ethnostate they call the Northwest Territorial Imperative. The Cascadia name and flag have been appropriated by white supremacists like the Northwest Front, who call for a sovereign white nation in the Pacific Northwest. In 2017, a man who had posted on Facebook calling for Cascadia as a white homeland murdered two people on the Portland light rail. White nationalists in the region are notorious for using hipster imagery, mixing progressive rhetoric surrounding environmental issues with calls for racial purity, and hiding in Discord channels with names like Cascadian Coffee Company. So if you're in the Cascadia region and a new acquaintance asks if you want to join their online coffee company, it might be best to think twice. Aztlan. When the Spanish arrived in Mexico, they found the Aztecs living in the majestic city of Tenochtitlan. But the Aztecs had not always lived there. According to the Codex Albin, they originated far to the north, in a place called Aztlan. Historians tend to place Aztlan in either northwestern Mexico or the southwestern United States. In the centuries since, Aztlan has become a rally cry for indigenous rights, and a symbol of Mexican land taken by the United States. 
In 1848, the Mexican-American War ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The U.S. came away from the war with the future states of California, Utah, and Nevada, as well as parts of Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and Wyoming. Many people chose to stay in their homes even as the land changed hands. Their children became part Chicano, people of Mexican descent born in the U.S. During the activism of the 1960s, the Chicano movement asserted itself through groups like the Brown Berets with tactics drawn from the Black Panthers. They saw the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo as illegitimate, whether by law or natural right. Some argued for the creation of the República del Norte, a Republic of the North, that would give the southwestern states to Mexico. In 1969, the spiritual plan of Aztlan declared the reincorporation of Aztlan as the Chicano's inevitable destiny, which would combine the area lost in the Mexican-American War with the northwestern Mexican states of Baja, Sonora, and Chihuahua. This dream has been termed La Reconquista, the reconquest, in allusion to the Catholic reconquest of Muslim Spain. The dream of Aztlan is kept alive by academics like Charles Trujillo, a law professor at the University of New Mexico, who was quoted at least once saying that such a nation should be brought into being by any means necessary. But mostly, he was satisfied that gradual demographic change would lead to a Chicano majority, which would vote to rejoin Mexico. Trujillo also had some fringe legal ideas relevant to secession movements elsewhere. He believed that the Articles of Confederation were not superseded by the Constitution, so the Articles' guarantee of states' sovereignty, freedom, and independence was still binding. Most legal scholars disagree and point out that, after all, the full name of the document was the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. Jose Angel Gutierrez, a political science professor at the University of Texas, agrees that demographic replacements will put things right, saying, this is our homeland and we are entitled to it. We are the host, everyone else is a guest, adding, it is not our fault that whites don't make babies. La Reconquista has been embraced by the National Front of Mexico, which describes itself as third positionist and has half-heartedly refused claims of fascism. In addition to the lands of Aztlan, the openly expansionist National Front also calls for Mexico to annex parts of Central America. The dream of Aztlan has seeped deep into Mexican culture. Vicente Fox was a president of Mexico from 2000 to 2006. He described himself as president of 123 million Mexicans, 100 million in Mexico, and 23 million more in the United States. In 2008, Absolute Vodka was criticized for a billboard ad that showed Mexico with its pre-1848 borders. The company defended the billboard as hearkening to a time which the population of Mexico may feel was more ideal. Some believe that time is coming to us again, but these secession movements are not limited to joining with foreign countries or groups of states. Some calls come from just one state, California. Our biggest state by population and third biggest by area, it's no surprise that California has been the subject of numerous calls for independence. It's been included in plans to rejoin Mexico as part of the Republica del Norte. Northern California has been included in calls for an independent Cascadia. Even more than secession movements, California has been the subject of numerous plans for partition, 220 since it achieved statehood in 1850. It was partitioned once already, in 1804 when the Spanish divided Alta, or Upper California, which was dominated by Franciscan missionaries, from Baja California to the south, which was dominated by Dominicans. After the Mexican-American War, Alta California was claimed by the United States while Baja remained part of Mexico. In 1965, the California State Senate voted to divide the state in two, but the proposal died in the State Assembly. In 1992, the opposite happened. A proposal for partition passed the Assembly, but died in the State Senate. As cultural issues became more heated in the 2000s, plans for partition shifted from a simple north-south divide to divisions along cultural lines, severing metropolitan San Francisco and LA from more rural and conservative areas. Yet plans for outright secession have have been few and far between, even though an independent California would have the fifth largest economy in the world. Yes, California is one political action committee advocating for California's secession. It was founded by Louis J. Marinelli, who had previously campaigned against gay marriage. Yet Marinelli claimed he'd since had a change of heart on LGBT issues and told journalists, the best people to govern California are us Californians. In 2023, Yes, California introduced a ballot measure proposing the secession of coastal cities. This time, Marinelli was explicit about wanting California out of the U.S. to get the extreme, far 
far-left liberals and progressives who are ruining the country as a whole to go and build a progressive utopia of their own. Marinelli had spent five years teaching kindergarten in Russia, and yes, California was accused of taking Russian money. He now lives in Arkansas. A more genuine movement, one built by people who actually want to live there, is the California National Party, or CNP, which models itself on the Scottish National Party. The CNP supports secession but also has plans for the here and now. Higher taxes on top earners, a federal reparations program, and a state bank of California to replace predatory payday loan services. As the home of Silicon Valley, the CNP advocates for a statewide innovation fund, which would support critical research into clean energy and water conservation. In this way, the CNP hopes to lay the groundwork for California's eventual independence. And for our next secession movement, we'll need to go west. No, not east. Don't worry, we'll get to those Texans to the state that is already literally independent from the rest of the country. Free Hawaii. It's the last state to join the Union. Might it also be the first to go? The story of Hawaii's incorporation into the United States is recent enough, and controversial enough, to make independence there uniquely plausible. Europeans first discovered Hawaii in 1778. A century later, the native population had dropped by 90% due to violence and disease. Only 50,000 natives remained. In 1893, Queen Liliuokalani was overthrown in a plot that left Sanor Dole president of an independent Hawaii, although the island became a U.S. territory just a few years later. Like indigenous groups across the Western Hemisphere, Native Hawaiians continue to suffer from poor health, low education, and high rates of unemployment and incarceration. The 1960s brought renewed focus to activist movements worldwide, and Hawaii was no exception. But whereas other movements receded at a decade's end, activism in Hawaii intensified through the 1980s, as urbanization and increased tourism made issues of inequality more glaring. In 1993, Congress passed the Apology Resolution, which acknowledged that Queen Liliuokalani had been illegally deposed with backing by the United States. The 2009 Native Hawaiian Government Reorganization Act would have established federal recognition of an indigenous government, which the State Department would have to treat as one one sovereign nation to another. Yet indigenous rights groups resisted the act, which would have placed a 20-year time limit on bringing claims against the U.S. government. The Reorganization Act is opposed by groups like Kalahui Hawaii, a grassroots group for Hawaiian sovereignty formed in 1987, which flies the Hawaiian state flag upside down as a symbol of distress and dissent. Another group, Kapa Kaukau, organized the People's International Tribunal in 1993, which brought together indigenous groups from around the world for a show trial, in which the U.S. government was tried for violations of international law and found guilty. Many groups pushing for Hawaiian independence envisioned the restoration of the royal line of Queen Liliuokalani. Others, like the nation of Hawaii, advocate for a republic. Some independence activists try to use legal maneuvering, arguing that Hawaii's annexation was not legally binding because of the U.S.'s repeated treaty violations. In 2015, the Department of the Interior announced its intention to formally recognize a tribal government of native Hawaii. But activists say that, judging from examples on the mainland, tribal recognition will never lead to total sovereignty. A better path may be set by Puuhonua o Waimanalao, a 45-acre commune at the western edge of Oahu led by Dennis Kanahele, nicknamed Bumpy. In 1987, Kanahele led the takeover of an abandoned Coast Guard station and occupied it for 14 months, despite armed standoffs with police. Eventually, Kanahele was arrested and spent 14 months in jail, time he spent continuing to build his movement. 1993 was a busy year for Hawaiian activists. It was the 100-year anniversary of Queen Liliuokalani's overthrow. Kapa Kaukau brought together indigenous groups from around the world for the People's International Tribunal, and the U.S. issued the apology resolution in acknowledgement of the royal family's illegal deposition. Governor John Waihe, the first governor of indigenous Hawaiian ancestry, declared that independence was not a matter of if, but a matter of how, when, and in what form. That year, Bumpy Kanahele led 300 protesters to occupy Makapu Beach on Oahu. They began building houses, beachfront property at little expense but the risk to their lives. Fifteen months later, Governor Waihe offered a deal. The protesters would leave Makapu Beach in exchange for 45 acres at the foothills of the nearby Kulau Mountains, to be leased for 55 years at a cost of only $3,000 per year. 
The group accepted. They set up a local government managed by four women they called the Council of Antis. The commune sustains itself in part through marijuana cultivation and it has cryptocurrency called Aloha Coin. But the Hawaiians are not the only indigenous group that have pushed for their own sovereign nation. Republic of Lakota On December 17, 2007, a group of Lakota Indians announced their intention to withdraw from all treaties made with the U.S. government, declaring the independent Republic of Lakota. The group cited the 1969 Vienna Convention, which states that treaties can be nullified if one side has lied or violated human rights. The announcement came just months after the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a non-binding agreement that the U.S. had nevertheless refused to sign. The proposed Republic of Lakota would encompass roughly 93,000 square miles of land across the northern Great Plains states. The boundaries coincide with those set by the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie and are cited with great specificity. An irregular line marking the Yellowstone River to the north, the North Platte River to the south, the Missouri River to the east, and the west. Citizenship of the Republic of Lakota would be open to anyone willing to surrender their U.S. passport. The economy would would depend on harnessing the massive amounts of wind power sweeping through the Great Plains. The Lakota people are part of the Sioux Nation. When Europeans arrived, they were small-scale agriculturalists living in the Ohio River Valley. With the disruption of colonialism, the Lakota moved west to the Great Plains, becoming skilled horsemen and buffalo hunters, eventually becoming the most powerful of the Sioux tribes. In 1851, the Lakota signed the first Treaty of Fort Laramie in which they were promised dominion over the Great Plains in exchange for allowing American settlers to pass along the Oregon Trail. The treaty was to last as long as the river flows and the eagle flies. The second treaty of Fort Laramie in 1868 promised tribal control of nearly half of modern-day South Dakota. But just a few years later, this agreement broke down with the discovery of gold in the Black Hills. Despite Lakota victories like the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876, the influx of gold prospectors could not be staunched. In 1877, the Lakota ceded the Black Hills to the U.S., but the session is controversial, as such agreements were supposed to include the consent of three quarters of Lakota men. In 1903, in Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock, the Supreme Court ruled that Congress had the ability known as plenary powers, to unilaterally terminate treaties with Indian tribes. Today, the Lakota occupy Pine Ridge Reservation in one of the poorest counties in the U.S. The reservation is being continuously checkerboarded as land is leased or sold to military, logging, and mining concerns. One estimate claims the loss of 50 million acres in just the last 50 years. Pine Ridge Reservation was the setting for the 1890 massacre at Wounded Knee, in which nearly 300 Lakota died. In 1973, the site was occupied for 71 days by members of the American Indian Movement, including activist Russell Means. Means was born on the Pine Ridge Reservation in 1939. He joined the American Indian Movement and took part in its occupations of Alcatraz and Mount Rushmore before becoming an actor with roles in Last of the Mohicans, Disney's Pocahontas, and Curb Your Enthusiasm. In 1980, the Lakota joined other Sioux tribes in bringing suit against the United States for violation of treaties surrounding the Black Hills. The Supreme Court found in the tribe's favor and awarded them a settlement of $105 million. But the Sioux have refused the money because accepting it would mean forfeiting their claims to the land. Still, the money sits in an account gathering interest, awaiting acceptance. In addition to violation of treaty agreements, the 2007 delegation cited the dismal living conditions of the reservation. Pine Ridge and its neighbor, Rosebud Reservation, account for the two poorest counties in the U.S. In winter, the temperatures drop to Arctic levels and the wind howls through the poorly maintained houses. After presenting the State Department with notice of their secession, the delegation made contact with embassies of countries rife with anti-American feeling. Serbia, Venezuela, Bolivia. The great flaw in the plan was that they had no backing from their own tribal government. The delegation had proceeded on their own and was mostly based around the charismatic Russell Means. The Republic of Lakota maintains its website of legal documents, but its energies ebbed with the death of Means in 2012. But let's take a look at the region best known for its secession tendencies, the South. League of the South 
150 years after the Civil War, we find that the former states of the Confederacy still house some of the nation's most active secession movements. The League of the South is a neo-Confederate organization founded in 1994, which aims to establish a free and independent Southern Republic with a more traditional, church-focused way of life. Formerly part of the neo-Nazi Nationalist Front, the League of the South was instrumental in organizing the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, aka the one with the tiki torch as well as a White Lives Matter rally in Shelbyville, Tennessee. It was designated a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center in 2000. The League has some surprising connections to academia. Its president, Michael Hill, is a former history professor at the historically black Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, specializing in British history. The League abounds with imagery rooted in Celtic mythology. Hill himself often appears wearing the St. Andrew's Cross of the Scottish flag. Another early founder, Thomas Woods, is a Harvard-educated historian and libertarian commentator who has since distanced himself from the group. An independent nation runs by the League of the South would include severely limited immigration and no standing army, personal income, or property tax. Such a nation would re-stigmatize what it calls perversity and all that seeks to undermine marriage and the family. In addition to the Confederacy, the League takes inspiration from the Italian Lega Nord in the north of Italy, which similarly uses a supposed Celtic heritage to make its appeals for regional separatism. In 2006, the League of the South sent representatives to the first North American Secessionist Convention, which brought together independence groups from around the country. The next year, the League of the South co-hosted the event with the Second Vermont Republic, who we'll hear about more later. A militia for the League, called the Indomitables, eventually morphed into the Southern Defense Force. Members were recruited with the slogan, Are You Ready to Be a Man Among Men?, taken from posters recruiting for the Rhodesian Army in the 1960s. Rhodesia has become a popular touchstone for white nationalists because of their efforts to maintain a separate white ethnostate in Africa. In 2015, the group celebrated the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, fetting his assassin, John Wilkes Booth, as a Southern hero. The League of the South's goal is to secede and establish an independent South that would ban interracial marriage and establish a quasi-fusal hierarchy composed of superiors, equals, and inferiors. Non-whites would be allowed in the country so long as they acknowledged the superiority of the Anglo-Celtic majority. But let's take a closer look at some of those other groups who attended the Independence Conference. Second Vermont Republic in 2006, the State House in Montpelier, Vermont played host to an unusual gathering of groups from around the country. It was the first North American separatist convention, which brought together independence movements like Free Hawaii and the Alaskan Independence Party, as well as the League of the South and Christian Exodus, which aimed to establish a sovereign theocracy outside the United States. The meeting was hosted by a group called the Second Vermont Republic, or SVR, a secessionist group with a complex mixture of political allegiances. Thomas Naylor founded the SVR in 2003. In his self-published book, The Vermont Manifesto, Naylor lays out the group's primary goals, to end military entanglements abroad and pursue environmental justice. In 2004, the SVR issued the Middlebury Declaration, in which they detailed their plans to encourage secessionist movements around the world, in addition to their ultimate task, the peaceful dissolution of the American Empire. With the widespread belief that the war in Iraq was really about access to oil, it made sense to conflate environmental issues with a denunciation of American military power. In 2005, Naylor founded the Middlebury Institute with Kirkpatrick Sale, a New York Times journalist best known for leading a group called the Neo-Luddites and prone to anti-technology stunts like smashing computers on stage. Sale also wrote a book criticizing Columbus for human rights abuses. Vehemently anti-war and environmentalist, the SVR played to a certain image of Vermont progressive but this was far from the whole story. Naylor was born in Mississippi and was previously an emeritus professor of economics at Duke University. He moved to Vermont in 1993, feeling driven there by the violent crime plaguing American cities. In Vermont, Naylor became acquainted with retired diplomat George Kennan. Maybe the most famous diplomat of the 20th century, Kennan was known as the architect of the Cold War containment policy, but he was also an outspoken critic of the Vietnam War and later, the war in Iraq. Kennan suggested the United States be broken in 
into a dozen or so smaller republics, believing that immigration from Latin American nations would soon make the country too culturally fragmented to function effectively. The SVR is deeply intertwined with the neo-Confederate movement. They share an intellectual mentor in Emory University professor Donald Livingston, who has written extensively on the Civil War, framing it as one of unprovoked aggression by the North. Many SVR members are also part of the Abbeville Institute, the scholarly arm of the League of the South. Abbeville Institute member and Loyola University professor Thomas DiLorenzo wrote The Real Lincoln, a 2002 book postulating that the Civil War was fomented for the express purpose of eliminating the constitutional right of states to secede. By 2007, its second year, the Second Vermont Republic was co-hosting the Separatist Convention with the League of the South, and the meeting was capped with a group sing-along of Dixie, the unofficial national anthem of the Confederacy. But now it's time to get to the state that always comes to mind when talking about a single state trying to secede, Texas. The League of the South's plans for secession naturally include the economic powerhouse that is Texas, but Texas has plans for a nation of its own. In 2021, state representatives introduced a bill to leave the U.S. and establish an independent republic. It was a tremendous victory for the Texas nationalist movement and its president, Daniel Miller, who had been working towards it since 2005. Miller spreads awareness via the Texas First Pledge, in which signatories pledge to secure the Mexican border, promote cultural and economic self-reliance, and most of all, support all actions or legislation that fully realizes the freedom and independence of Texas. More than 100 state and local candidates have signed the Texas First Pledge, including the reigning Commissioner of Agriculture. Like other secession groups, the Texas nationalist movement has received funds from the Russian government funneled through a nonprofit. It would be more surprising if Texas didn't have an active independence movement. The Lone Star State operated as a sovereign republic for only 10 years, from 1836 to 1846, but independence has been fondly remembered ever since. Political insiders speculate that Texas's affinity for independence comes in regular cycles, invariably when Democrats are in control of the federal government and can thus be safely ignored. Yet experts said similar things about the vote for Brexit, from which the Texas nationalist movement takes its own portmanteau, Texit. Calls for Texit surged in the wake of Biden's election in 2020 and the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline. In 2020, Congressman Randy Weber posted an image on Facebook that showed Texas being forcibly pried from the rest of the country. The caption read, I think it's getting about that time, y'all. And unlike other states, secession movements in Texas have enjoyed an unusual amount of institutional support. At a Tea Party rally in 2009, then-Governor Rick Perry voiced his belief that, because of its past as an independent republic, Texas alone retained the constitutional right to secede, although Perry later walked these comments back. In a speech at Texas A&M in 2021, Senator Ted Cruz told students, We're not there yet, and if there comes a point where it's hopeless, when I think we take NASA, we take the military, we take the oil. In 2022, five of the eight candidates in the Republican primary for governor publicly committed to Texas, together winning nearly a third of the vote. Texas may well be suited for independence. Its gross state product of about $2 trillion, second in the nation only to California, would give a sovereign state the 10th largest economy in the world, larger than that of both Canada and Australia. Meanwhile, the Texas Rangers would be poised to assume matters of national security. Yet, an independent Texas may still run into financial problems. In 2019, Texas paid $272 billion to the federal government, but received back $300 billion. Federal money typically comprises one-third of the state budget. One expert estimates that a nation of Texas would have to find a way to get an additional $9,000 or so per person living there, possibly through income or sales taxes. As a place with no state income tax currently, this may be a bridge too far. Alternatively, with the money kept closer to home, citizens of an independent Texas may find their hearts have grown just as big as the land. But the only state to have even more land than Texas also has ambitions of going it alone. Alaska. Alaska is a world apart. It's already bigger than many other countries. It has natural resources galore. Why shouldn't it give independence a try? Well, they're working on it. In 1958, Alaskans participated in a referendum on their future. Voters only had two choices, remain a territory or become a state. According to founders of the Alaskan Independence Party, or AIP, that made the whole thing illegitimate. 
Founded in 1973 by Joe Vogler, a former gold miner, the AIP argued that the 1958 referendum was invalid, because it should have given voters the option of becoming an independent nation, or at least a commonwealth. Although it should be noted that the difference between a commonwealth and a state is pure semantics with no legal bearing. For decades, Vogler ran the AIP as a third party similar to the Theocratic Constitution Party, formerly the U.S. Taxpayers Party. He ran for governor in 1982 and proved his ability to think outside the box, proposing that troublesome glaciers be obliterated using nuclear weapons. In 1990, Wally Hickel, former Secretary of the Interior under Nixon, was elected governor on the AIP ticket, one of the few third party candidates to win a governorship. In 1993, Joe Vogler was supposed to present his ideas on Alaskan independence to the United Nations, but before he had the chance to, he was killed in a robbery gone wrong. However, AIP members found the timing too convenient, and suspected political assassinations with the robbery as a cover-up. However, this cover-up was never verified. Now, Governor Hickel had never endorsed the AIP's secession aims. In fact, he had been instrumental in achieving Alaskan statehood back in the 50s. After Vogel's death, Hickel rejoined the Republican Party. The new AIP chief, Mark Crisson, de-emphasized secession and brought the party more in line with other conservative third parties, staunchly pro-life, anti-gun control, favoring homeschooling and limited government. Instead of immediate secession, the AIP now called for another referendum with independence on the ballot. Still, the party sent delegates to the North American secessionist conventions. They made the requisite noises about states' rights, taxationist theft, and fear of a new world order. And Crisson nurtured a young politician named Sarah Palin, helping her become first mayor of Wasilla, then governor, and eventually the Republican candidate for vice president in 2008. That same year, Palin sent a videotaped message to the AIP convention in Fairbanks telling them to keep up the good work. Palin's message resounded with pioneer values, self-sufficiency, and limited government. Yet these frontier states are often the biggest recipients of government support. Proceeds from oil and mining extraction in the state are invested and kept in the Alaska Permanent Fund. As of 2019, the fund was worth approximately $64 billion, and paid each resident an average annual dividend of $1,600. Some call it the nation's only functioning example of a universal basic income. Which leads us now to the Great Salt Lake, where a more historical example of secession awaits. Deseret. Like Texas, the most active secession movements can sometimes come from places that were once independent, however briefly. Such was the case for Deseret, the proposed nation-state of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or as they're more commonly known, Mormons. After being chased out of Illinois, the first Mormons arrived in Salt Lake Valley in 1847. They initially petitioned for statehood under the name Deseret, which is the name of a honeybee in the Book of Mormon, a symbol of industriousness and community. As first proposed in 1850, the state of Deseret would have been massive, encompassing not just all of modern-day Utah, but portions of California, Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming, Arizona, Oregon, New Mexico, and Nevada. But the Mormons became targets of outrage for their practice of polygamy. Their first petition for statehood was denied, and in 1857, President James Buchanan sent 2,500 troops, roughly a third of the entire peacetime army, to quell unrest and replace Brigham Young as territorial governor. The so-called Utah War was settled largely by diplomatic means, give or take a massacre or two. Brigham Young stepped down and the non-Mormon population grew. In 1890, Wilford Woodruff, then president of the LDS Church, announced that the practice of polygamy amongst the Mormons was to end. Just five years after this change, Utah became the 45th state. In 2018, Twitter started seeing tweets marked hashtag Desnat calling for the creation of a sovereign nation-state of Deseret, a Mormon-led theocracy with borders that encompassed and went beyond the modern state of Utah. Some users have employed neo-Nazi imagery to suggest that Deseret would be a white ethnostate. The hashtag was created by Logan Smith, a resident of Idaho who believed Mormons should be united spiritually, morally, economically, and politically. Users have been accused of harassing LGBT members, non-Mormons, feminists, and producers of pornography. 
The movement has also reintroduced the concept of blood atonement, an idea disavowed by the mainstream Mormons but common in fundamentalist circles. In 2021, journalists identified a prolific poster of racist and anti-Semitic Desnat content as Matthias Seacott, an assistant attorney general in Alaska. Seacott was eventually let go as a result of this. Like so much else online, the outrageousness of the tweets obscure the truth of the sentiments behind it, which likely range from full-throated believer to someone who claims to be just joking. New York. There may be no place in the country with a stronger claim to self-sufficiency than New York City, noted insomniac and engine of the world's financial markets. Yet New York has seen surprisingly few attempts at secession. During the lead-up to the Civil War, Democratic Mayor Fernando Wood proposed the city secede to become an independent city-state called the Free City of Tri-Insula, composed of Manhattan, Long Island, and Staten Island. Like many Northerners, Mayor Wood feared the disruption of the cotton trade with Europe. Wood's proposal the proposal never got very far, and it was totally deflated by the patriotic fervor that accompanied the war's outbreak. Still, the war remained deeply unpopular in the city, culminating in the draft riots in 1863. Upstate from the city, one town did go so far as to formally secede. The residents of Townline, New York voted to secede, but because the town was unincorporated, the vote had no legal bearing, and the Confederacy declined to recognize the breakaway hamlet. With no legal recognition of their secession, Townline could only ceremonially rejoin the Union, which they did in 1946. Generally, New York has been geared more toward partition than secession. In 1969, author Norman Mailer ran for mayor on a platform that would have made New York City the nation's 51st state. In Mailer's version, the city would get to keep the name New York. The rest of the state could call itself Buffalo. When then-Mayor Michael Bloomberg testified in 2011 that the city paid $11 billion more to the state in taxes than it received back, it reignited calls for New York City to go its own way. Meanwhile, parts of upstate New York are sometimes just as eager to get away, feeling overlooked in state politics and wary of environmentalist legislation like bans on fracking. As the memory of the Civil War recedes into the past, secession may seem more like a plausible solution for our polarized nation. Whether that rupture appears in the heart of the old confederacy or at the western edges of empire, the first successful independence movement may create a chain reaction of imitators. If nothing else, school children all over the country will need a new wording for their daily recitation. One nation, indivisible.